All right. Now, yeah, we're back uh, two weeks ago. We had our last class. All right, Peter's writing. He's writing this letter. It's shortly before his execution in Rome. That took place probably around A.D. 64 to 66. So he's writing shortly before his death in Rome in the mid-60s. And he may well be sending this letter to the same Christians to whom he addressed First Peter. That's uh, maybe even likely that he's doing that, but it's possible that he's not. It's possible that he's sending, sending this letter to a different group, and if that's the case, the best, you know, the best hunch, the best judgment we can make on that is that he's sending it to Christians in Asia Minor, Macedonia, or Greece, somewhere around there, and we think that because these people had, at least, had received at least one letter from Paul and that's the area of Paul's ministry and where he wrote his letters. You could say, well, couldn't Paul have written a letter to some other? Yeah, he could have. But we just kind of have to go on probabilities then. And if that's right, then we're still left with a predominantly Gentile audience. Now, he's writing here. The main reason for writing is to combat certain false teachers who have arisen within the church and who are threatening this community he's writing to. So it's an occasional letter, even though it's typically listed historically as a Catholic epistle or a universal epistle. He's not writing just to Christianity in general. He's writing to people in a situation, a circumstance. They are being threatened by these false teachers, and that's why he's writing there. And these false teachers, they were doctrinally and morally corrupt. They denied a future coming of Christ in judgment. You know, where is this coming, he promised? No, that's not going to happen. And they did that, and then they, they engaged in all kinds of uh, sins of the flesh. So this is, and he's writing to combat that, and you'll see this all through the letter. Right from the very beginning, he's addressing these things. It's tied in with his call for moral and ethical purity because you have people who are saying, listen, uh, no, that's not important. And we'll see that. Now, he opens up the first four verses of chapter 1. He prays for grace and peace to be multiplied to them, and he does that seeing how Christ has blessed them so richly already in giving Christians everything necessary for godly living, and in giving them the precious and very great promises of Christ's consummating return and of the new heavens and new earth as described in chapter 3. Now, I went through that uh, two weeks ago. And when we ended two weeks ago, we were looking at chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. And I want to repeat a little bit of what I said there, and then we'll, we'll move on. He says in, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, And also for this very reason... Making every effort, supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with perseverance, and perseverance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are existing in you and increasing, they make you neither useless nor unfruitful in the, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the man in whom these things are not present is blind by being nearsighted, having forgotten the cleansing of his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for by doing these things you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided to you. Now, verses 5 through 7 here. They're based on a descript the description of the blessings that he gave in verses 3 and 4. He says, for this very reason. He gives these, the description of these blessings, that he's given us everything for godly living. He's given us these great and very precious promises of his consummating return and the new heavens and new earth. And for this very reason, because he's, he's given that, we must work to be the people that God wants us to be. We must make every effort to be morally and ethically pure. We are, to, we are to put these things on. We are to have these things in our lives and have them increasing in our lives. And I mentioned two weeks ago that he uses a conventional literary form, a form that was known in the, in the ancient world. He uses this, this form to provide a memorable summary of the kind of qualities that should characterize a Christian's life, qualities we are to make every effort to have. So these are, the, these are things here that Christians should have in their lives. And he gives us this summary. And the last virtue that we discussed two weeks ago was, was brotherly affection or brotherly love or brotherly kindness. And that's the, the next to the last item in the list. 
This brotherly love, it refers to the, to the love or the bond that naturally exists among siblings. It doesn't mean it always exists. You know, you can have brothers and sisters that hate each other. But, you know, the norm, the ideal is that you have brothers and sisters because of that, you know, that relationship. They have this bond to one another. So it refers to what normally exists among physical brothers and sisters. And in the early church, it was applied to spiritual siblings. It was applied to brothers and sisters in Christ. So we are commanded that we are to make every effort to ha- that we would have toward fellow believers the kind of commitment that ideally one has towards one's brothers and sisters. And I always use that example. I mix up who so when you and Buddy, when Buddy called you that time, or did you call Buddy? All right, John's car was broken down. I've told you this before. Somewhere, uh, where was it? He's in Baltimore. We lived in South Jersey. And so uh, his car breaks down. And he calls my brother Buddy at like, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. He says, my car's broken down. Come get me. And my brother went and got him. And you say, well, why would he do that? He said, because it's his brother. <laughs> you see, I mean, they just, you know, it's like, well, what are you going to do? I wish his car hadn't broken down, but my brother called me and, all right, I'm up and I'm going. And there's something you see of this commitment to one another and this bond that the early church recognized and that it transcended all of these differences in the world, differences of race and all this kind of thing. Trans, it transcended those things and they had this bond and he's urging them that this is to characterize your life as a Christian. And then the last uh, quality or virtue that he lists with the last one, we're called to love beyond the circle of fellow believers. See, I think this, the one is that we are to have this kind of love that characterizes spiritual brothers and sisters. We're to have this kind of bond with one another. But he goes larger than that. In the last one, we're to have this commitment to the welfare of all others. Here's what Moose says in his commentary. He says, the first word he uses is brotherly love, Philadelphia, love of the brother, or as NIV renders it, brotherly kindness. In distinction from the second word, the familiar agape, Philadelphia probably refers to love expressed among fellow Christians. Agape, then, is not a completely different love, but embraces love of the brethren as one sphere of Christian love in its fullest scope, the spirit-given act of the will by which we treat other people with active benevolence. That's how we, that's how we relate to other people. We seek their welfare. We seek to bless them. This is what love is. He says, surely it's not by chance that love, the crown of Christian virtues, see 1 Corinthians 13, comes at the climax of Peter's staircase of Christian qualities. So here we have have both brotherly love, brotherly affection, then we have love where he, he goes in a broader sense. Now growing in these things, that's what it means to be productive and fruitful as a Christian. That's, that's what it means to be productive and fruitful as a Christian. It is having these things and growing in them. That's how they keep you. You know, many of the trans... You see that they... they uh, uh, a lot of the translations say they, they keep you from being useless and unfruitful. Well, the way they do it, that's the definition of being productive and fruitful. Is that you have these qualities in your life as a Christian and they're increasing... As I, as I translate here, he literally says, for if these things are existing in you and increasing, they make you neither useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. Having these characteristics, these virtues, these qualities in you and increasing, that is what it means to be a productive and fruitful Christian. who are expanding, growing in Christ-likeness. And it's a, it's a very important thing. The unfruitful Christian, the unproductive Christian... The man without these ethical manifestations of faith, when I say man, man or woman, the person without these ethical manifestations of faith is blind in that he he can't see the implications of his salvation. What what does this talk about being blind? That's what it is. He's blind. He doesn't see the implications of his salvation. He has forgotten the significance of his prior cleansing from sin. He's living as though that that forgiveness means nothing to him. If he doesn't have these qualities, he's living as though the forgiveness he has received, it doesn't mean anything to him. He's living without regard for how does the one who had such mercy on me want me to live? 
So here is someone God has bestowed tremendous mercy on us. He has forgiven us of our sins. And he says, well, if you're not happy, if you don't live this way, if you don't have these qualities, you're living as though you don't care how he wants you to live. The one who bestowed this tremendous mercy on you. If somebody saved your life, you would be very, very interested in what did they want of you. Well, God has bestowed this tremendous mercy on us. And it's just natural that a heart that is grateful for that will say, what do you want of me? And so if we don't do that, we are blind in that we have forgotten. See, we have forgotten what it means. We've forgotten the significance of the prior cleansing of our sins. We must exert effort. He says this. I said this last week. Making every effort. We must exert effort to grow spiritually. And in doing so, look at this. I think he says, therefore, brothers, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Okay, he's telling them you need, you need these qualities. They need to be growing. Make every effort to have these things in you and to have them growing. Then he says, therefore, brothers, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For by doing these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided to you. We must exert effort to grow spiritually. And in doing this, we're assured that we'll never stumble from the path we're on. And that's a path that leads to glory, that leads to where? It leads to entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you have these things and are increasing, if you are growing spiritually, that is a safeguard of your falling from the path that leads to the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a protection to you. You need to be doing this. And he says, this will keep you. For by doing these things, you will never stumble in this way. Entry will be richly provided. If you will be at this business, if you will be taking your faith seriously, if you will be pursuing the things of Christ and seeking to grow in Christ's likeness, seeking to manifest these virtues in your life, that will keep you on the path. That will keep you from stumbling off the path. See, there's danger in stagnating in faith. You see, there's danger. If we're not growing, we become more vulnerable to the enemy. If we're just sitting here, you know, it's like there is no neutral position. You can't park. If you're just sitting here, you're more vulnerable to the enemy. And he's saying, listen, you be about growing in faith. That will be a safeguard to you. If you sit, you think the enemy sits? He doesn't sit. You know, everything that's bombarding you from the time you wake up and there, he's not sitting. He's preaching. <laughs> he's preaching. You're sitting here and he's just feeding you all kinds of stuff and everything in the culture and around you. And maybe from your friends and everywhere else. So if you stagnate, if you sit still in your faith, if you're not growth conscious, if this isn't, you know, what you're about, you become vulnerable to being taken off the path to stumbling in that path that leads to this eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He then says in verses 12 and 15, Therefore, therefore, I will always be poised to remind you of these things, though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that is present with you. These things that he's talking about, these things that you need to be doing, these Christian virtues that you need to have and be growing in, I'll always remind you of these things, though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth that is present with you. And I think it right, as long as I'm in this tent, to arouse you by a reminder, knowing that the putting off of my tent is imminent, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will also be diligent to cause you always to have, after my departure, the memory of these things. Verse 12, he begins, he says, therefore, so. And here's the, the logic of it. The logic of what he's saying here is because spiritual growth is a safeguard against falling away, falling from the faith, stumbling on the path, and thus it has relevance to entering the consummated kingdom. It's a matter of top priority. Because this spiritual growth 
is a safeguard against stumbling on the path, and therefore it's relevant to entering, to receiving this entry into the consummated kingdom. It's a matter of top priority. As I said, we have to be actively tending our faith, consciously seeking to be more like Jesus. And if we're not doing that, we're in danger of having our faith erode. You see, people don't wake up one day and just say, you know, maybe there's some examples of this, but certainly by and large what happens is somebody drifts away. You say, wake up and say, you know, I just don't, I'm I'm not just going to be involved doing any of this stuff. And then there's this slow drifting away. That is why people are interested when people don't come to church. It is not that they sit here and say, oh, we just want to mark something on a roll. If you've been around any time at all, you know that when people stop joining the church in assembly, that's a signal of something. Okay, it's a signal of something, and it a lot many times it begins there and just oh you know no 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 I'm just I'm fine I'm just this and this this miss 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 you know there are people you have to beg to come to church, right? I mean you call them up they'll come, you don't call them up they're not coming. See, it, it, it's deeper than that. It's not simply oh you just care if I sit in the pew. No, it's not about that. It's about what's going on in your heart and in your life. And these things are indicators of that. But he's talking about, you see, this idea that we we can drift away. If we're not growth conscious, we wind up, we're more vulnerable to having our faith erode. That's what he's saying. He's just talked about. And so we can't settle into this comfort zone. We just say, listen, I'm not going to be aware of this growth conscious. I'm not going to be open to rebuke. I'm not going to have relationships where people say, that's not right, that's not right. You know, you should have done this. I don't want any of that. I just want to sit and be left alone and just drift. Okay, so he's, he's saying, listen, this is important. He's just told them that. And it's so important that he says that as long as he is alive, this idea of being growth conscious and and having these virtues and having them growing in your life, it's so important because it is a safeguard and therefore is relevant to entering the consummated kingdom. It is so important. Peter, he says, as long as he's alive, he's always going to remind them of these things. That's pretty important. As long as he's alive, he's going to remind them of these things, and he'll do all he can to ensure that they remember them even after his impending death. Well, the Spirit of God is saying through Peter that this is really important. This idea that we we be tuned into, and we be reminded of the significance of growth consciousness, of being plugged into Christ, having that animate our lives and not something we just said, yeah, I've done that, I was baptized, I put that on the shelf, now life goes on. No. We are Christ conscious all the time. And see, that's a safeguard. That's a safeguard. That's why it's so important. We need to remind one another of the importance of spiritual growth. That's a function. That is part of our responsibility to each other. If Peter's doing it, Peter says it's so important, I'm going to do it to my last breath, and I'm going to do all I can to make sure that after I'm dead, you're going to remember it. Well, then shouldn't we be doing it for one another? But when we do it for one another, what's the reaction? I'm afraid that sometimes the reaction is, who you think you are? Huh? You know, you think you're a big shot? No, I'm a brother in Christ who's trying to help you. And see, from the, so that's from the side of, of helping in that regard. And then we have to wind up from, from the other side. We have to have a responsibility of, well, regularly assembling is important. Because, you know, what are we doing here? As we sit here in this room, we are hearing the Word of God. When we gather and worship, Terry's preaching. He's, God is speaking to us. And as we're with, together with one another, what are we doing? We're talking about spiritual things. And then we need to have Christian relationships. So we can have brothers and sisters who can help us with things and keep our perspective here. And we need to be studying the Word of God. Right? I mean, don't we need to study the Word of God to drink in God's perspective on things? Sure we do. And so this is a very important thing, and we have a role to play. Now, Peter knows from his situation... This is the way I read this, and many people read it. Apparently, he sees the handwriting on the wall. He knows from his situation that he's about to be executed, 
which is in keeping with the prophecy that Jesus made about him that's later recorded in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, that when he was old, he would be executed. He wasn't going to die a, a smooth death, that when he was old, he was going to be executed. Well, now he's old and he's looking around and he says, okay, I see it. So he sees here that, that Christ's prophecy to him is about to be fulfilled, and I just love his attitude. You know, he's facing a death that is not going to be the kind, you know, it's not lethal injection. <laughs> you know, not sneaking up on this guy and putting him to sleep or something. This is death under Nero, and this is not good. And I just see, you know, and you see this with Paul too. Just this, I don't know, there's just this serenity to it. And he just writes and says, you know, I'm ready to die under Nero, which Eusebius, the late 3rd, early 4th century theologian and church historian, reports that he was, he was crucified in Rome. And so here he is facing that, and his concern is what? I'm concerned that you will be reminded of the significance of growing in Christ, even after I'm dead. And he has reminded not only them, but he's reminded us through this letter that he's written. So here is, it, it's an important thing. Then he says in, in, in verses 16 to 18, for not after following, see another four here, and I'll talk about that in a second, for not after following cleverly devised myths, did we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? But after becoming eyewitnesses of that one's majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when such a voice as this was conveyed to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this voice that was conveyed from heaven when being with him on the holy mountain. Now, one of the earlier editions of the NIV, I don't know if the later ones, the TNIV corrected it, but they dropped this opening word for, and in doing that, they concealed the connection that it has with what precedes it, which I think is, is quite important. You see, growth is crucial because it's key to staying on the path to entering the consummated kingdom, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And staying on that path is so important. Why? For the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. What are these people saying? These false teachers are saying, that's baloney. There's no second coming. That's not going to happen. Don't believe this. Don't believe there's going to be a consummating return. New heavens and new earth, judgment, all that. It's not happening. And he's saying, au contraire. Bon, au contraire. It is happening. And he see, wants to, why is it so important that we stay on this path to entering this eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? It is so important for the kingdom is for certain going to be consummated. It's not going to be, be on that path, grow in Christ likeness, be growth conscious so you're, you're protected and you enter into this and then it's going to be at the end saying, eh uh -huh. got you. That's not happening. It's not happening. Now the, now the argument that he makes here, it's, it's, it's interesting. See, Jesus is for sure coming back to finalize the kingdom he inaugurated at his first coming. I've been through that uh, perhaps from your side ad nauseum. Okay, he inaugurates the kingdom. We're in an overlap of ages. He's returning. That's when the kingdom will be consummated. And he's telling them that that day is coming. That second coming that these false teachers are denying is in fact coming. Now this phrase, power and coming, probably another Hendiades, meaning powerful coming or coming in power. And the vast majority of scholars, they understand that phrase as a reference to the second coming of Christ. Now, why do they do that? Well, they do that first because the word that Peter uses here when he says power and coming, coming, the word that he uses here, parousia, this is almost in, in, in Christian circles in the first century, this word, it's almost a technical term for the second coming. It was used so much that way it became just almost a technical term, the phrase that you use for that. Indeed, Peter is going to use that word, parousia, in chapter 3, verse 4, and chapter 3, verse 12, unambiguously in reference to Christ's return. Let me give you a couple of New Testament scholars, just so you know I don't make this stuff up. 
He says, the word coming is used through this Douglas Moo in his commentary. He says, the word coming is used throughout the New Testament as almost a technical term for Christ's return in glory. So much so that the underlying Greek word parousia has passed into our theological vocabulary. That is how we describe the second coming. In theological parlance, that's the parousia. I mean, why is it? It's because that word is used so frequently for it. Here's what Schreiner says. In the New Testament, the word parousia becomes virtually a technical term for the arrival or future coming of Jesus Christ. So the first reason that you know, nearly all scholars recognize this as a reference to the second coming is the use of this word parousia. Where he sits here and he says, when he says, when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus. Now Christ's return is associated with power in Mark chapter 13, 26, Matthew 24, 30, Luke 21, 27. So when you combine power with parousia, you're reinforcing the conclusion that he's referring to that powerful, glorious return. So they say, first we have parousia, which is almost a technical term for the coming, which Peter himself uses. We have it combined with power, which is a characteristic of Christ's return. And thirdly, the denial of the second coming by the false teachers, that's central to the letter. That's their whole deal. That's their theological error. They say, he's not coming back. Where's this coming he promised? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This coming he's promised. Decades gone by. Everything bops on the way it always has. No consummation. No changing of nature, no changing of the cosmos. Everything's just the way it is, the way our fathers were. You need to come off this thing. Now, they're saying that, and what is Peter saying here? He's saying, listen, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths. Okay, so what is, they're denying the coming. They're saying that the teaching that the coming is a myth, a fable, hogwash, and Peter is here saying, we didn't follow cleverly concocted myths or devised myths when we told you about the power. So isn't it clear what he's talking about? He's talking about the consummating return. When there's going to be a judgment, which they deny, which is partly why they live the way they do, and there's going to be the new heavens and new earth that Peter describes in chapter 3. So he says, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths in doing this. In assuring his readers of the certainty of the apostolic claim that the Lord Jesus is going to return in great power, which return is going to be an eschatological climax? See, marked by the final judgment and the creation of the, of the new heavens and new earth, in saying this, he is directly refuting the claim of the false teachers. They're saying one thing, he's saying, that's not right. What we, what the apostles, so the apostolic doctrine of the return of Christ in consummating glory is true. We didn't sell you a bill of goods. We didn't give you some junk. We weren't following myths and fables and all this kind of stuff when we told you this. That's how the false teachers are portraying it. They say, ah, this is all junk. You're not listening to this. Myths. Fables. He says, nonsense. We didn't do that at all. See, they denied, they denied he's, re he's returning and they, ju they obviously say, listen, that the, the contrary idea that he is returning, this consummating return, this eschatological climax, history coming to a conclusion. They're saying that that's all nonsense. They, they, they may have even thought, look, this is, a, is a, con, a cleverly concocted myth that they're using as a tool to restrain behavior. You know how those leaders are. You know, they're always trying to, you know, so they, they, this is a little something they, they dreamed up to keep the peons in line. I can see somebody saying that. I can see him saying that today. You see? But it's, it's, it's like, you know, but, but you have to read that part in. Now, here's what Moose says about these false teachers. I thought this was worth giving to you. He says, we do not know precisely why or on what basis the false teachers were denying Christ's return. In 3, 4 through 13, Peter puts particular stress on the radical change in the created world that will accompany Christ's return. Probably then, the false teachers thought that the world would continue on as it now was and denied that there would be any kind of eschatological climax in which good would be rewarded and evil punished. 
That this was the case seems to be confirmed by Peter's emphasis on the certainty of judgment. See, for example, chapter 2, verse 3b. And the false teacher's eschatological skepticism was undoubtedly tied to their immoral lifestyle. With no prospect of future judgment, one did not have to worry much about living a righteous life. There's another slide on this quote, but let me just say, this is how stuff works a lot of times. See, people who want to slide into immorality rationalize that in, in they have to get away from God. You see, they have to get away from God, and so what do they do? They rationalize it, and they come up with reasons why. Very few people simply honestly say, listen, I want to sin. That's why I'm leaving. They won't do that. They won't do that psychologically. They come up with all kinds of, well, you know, there's this, this, you know, somebody looked at me funny, or I said this, and I didn't get that, and I, all right, you know, I, you know, we're not perfect people. You know, I'm not naive about that. But I'm telling you, this is, this is a function here that has a bigger role, I'm convinced, than we give it credit for. Has a bigger role than that. Moo continues, he says, we can only speculate about the sources of these false teachers' denial of future eschatology. Certainly many Greek thinkers of Peter's day scorned any notion of divine providential control of history and of life after death. And these errorists may also have been influenced by a spiritualized eschatology of a type that Paul also had to deal with. Christians who thought that the final form of the kingdom had already arrived, 1 Corinthians 4.8, and that the resurrection had already taken place, 2 Timothy 2.18. You see there, Paul deals with that, what in theological terms is called overrealized eschatology. Christ inaugurates the kingdom, and it is a present reality, but we live in this overlap of ages. It is not until the second coming that it's consummated and all that is contrary to God's divine purpose is stripped out. So then is when we won't have death, mourning, crying, pain. But there are people, see, who are pulling, they were interpreting the present, the now, too much in terms of the not yet. They were pulling too much of what remains in the future into the now. And they're saying, listen, look here. You know, we, we've already, uh, the final form of the kingdom's already here. This is it. The resurrection's already taken place. Already happened. Well, he doesn't know, but that may be what's driving these people. Because they're denying the resurrection. They're denying, they're denying that Christ is coming again. They're denying this consummating return. And so he's after it, and he's telling them here. And all through the letter, already beginning, he's focusing on them. Okay, he denies that the message of Christ's glorious return, he denies that this was a cleverly concocted fairy tale. Now, he does so, this is interesting to me, and to a lot of commentators, he does so by asserting that he and some others, meaning James and John, were eyewitnesses of Christ's majesty when they were with him on the mountain of transfiguration. So he's clearly saying that what they personally experienced in the transfiguration event what he and James and John experienced in that event somehow disproves the false teacher's claim that the doctrine of the second coming is hogwash. They're saying it's hogwash. He's saying, not so. We didn't follow cleverly miss because we were eyewitnesses of his majesty on the mountain of transfiguration. So what they're saying is wrong because we were eyewitnesses of his majesty on the mountain of transfiguration. Well, how does that experience, how does that disprove the denial of Christ's consummating return? See, that aspect's less clear. That's less clear. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all suggest that the transfiguration was a fulfillment of a prediction, Christ's prediction, that some of the apostles wouldn't die until a specific manifestation of the coming of the kingdom of God. You see this in the way in Mark's terminology, until the kingdom of God come with power. And you say, well, what do you mean that they, they suggest that? Well, they suggest it in that each of them prefaces the transfiguration account with this prediction. The three synoptics, each of them does it. And then in the very next verse, the transfiguration is connected with this chronological marker that says in Matthew and Mark, in six days, in six days, and Luke says about eight days. But you have this prediction, then in six days, it is an indication that they're linked. You say, well, eh, I don't know about that. Well, that's how the early church understood it. 
You see, let me, let me read, to, here's a Jerome Nere from his commentary in the Anchor Bible series. He said, in the early church, there was a widespread interpretation of the transfiguration as the fulfillment of a prophecy made by Jesus that those standing here would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God come in power. So in some way, what he is seeing there is a fulfillment of this prediction that some of you here, Peter, James, and John, some of you aren't going to die until you get this preview, until you get this advanced showing of the glory of Christ in the second coming. So this is, this is what Peter is saying. This is clearly how Peter understood this. He seems to be saying that in seeing in the transfiguration, Christ's glorious and majestic nature, in seeing his divinity, they saw the full coming of his kingdom in the sense that they saw one who was too great to leave unfinished business, too great to leave creation in its, in its continuing state, its current continuing state of corruption. And thus they saw one who necessarily would return to consummate the kingdom of God, return to fully cash out the victory by ushering in the eternal state in which there was no death, no mourning, no crying, and no pain. He makes this connection between what he saw, what they were eyewitnesses of, and the second coming of Christ. And he says, these people who are saying that's hogwash, they're wrong because in the first place, we saw him on the mountain of transfiguration, and what we saw proves he's coming back. It proves he's coming back. Now Peter's saying at the second coming it was foreshadowed, that, that he's saying this, that it was foreshadowed in the transfiguration. This is, this is not a strange idea. This is not some esoteric thing. This is recognized by many scholars. Okay, I would say virtually all of them. Let me give you a few of them. This is Peter Davids, well-known New Testament scholar. This is the Pillar Commentary series. He says, Second Peter says that the transfiguration was a view into the future of the coming exaltation of Jesus, a view of his second coming with power and glory. Here is what uh, Thomas Schreiner says, New American Commentary series. He says, Peter defended the truth of the coming of Christ in a surprising manner. He appealed to the eyewitness testimony of what occurred at the transfiguration. Apparently, he conceived of the transfiguration as a proleptic, a previewing and prophetic indication of the glory and power of Christ that would be displayed at his future coming. Douglas Moo, in his commentary, says, Peter, James, and John saw, not in a vision or a dream, but at a specific time and place in history, Jesus parousia glory. And Peter wants us to believe that Christ will come again in glory because he did see this. Here's Gene Green in the Baker Exegetical Commentary. He says, The particular tenet of the heretic's teaching that Peter counters has to do with the eschatological parousia of Christ. He presents the transfiguration with its revelation of Christ's kingship as the guarantee of that final event. You see, he is telling them it is important for you, it is so important that I'm going to do all I can, spend my last breath in having you be growth conscious. Because growth consciousness is important for keeping you on the path that leads to this eschatological kingdom. And he says, look, that, and that is so important for, it's so important, the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated, contrary to what they're selling you. It's going to be consummated, and it's going to be consummated because... I was an eyewitness to the glory that guarantees it's going to be consummated. He's not through. He's not through. He has another, another leg he's going to give to them. He has something else he wants to say to them about this, and I'll just introduce this, and then the bell will ring. He says, okay, so he tells them that. We were eyewitnesses. Then he says, and we have the holy, reliable, prophetic word to which you do well in paying attention as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy ever was brought by the will of man. Rather, men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, see, this is part of his letter. He doesn't, you know, we, we rightly take this text and say, look, this talks about inspiration. But it functions in a letter. It's part of what he's saying. He doesn't just out of the blue just say, let me introduce you know, a completely unrelated subject. Ah, Lord willing, next week. Thank you. <laughs>